If I had never defined it, that's what you guys would have done anyway. If I actually gave you an example. Trust me. It's just, I mean, what else would you do? So what is the then, so let, let, uh, let's let beta v1, v2, da, 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 vn be a basis. For v, then we define we define partial f, partial x j at the point a to be what? What should the partial derivative of f in the x j direction at the point a be? Now here. Um, I'm using the notation phi beta is like x1, x2, x, xn. It's the, 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 the coordinates, the component functions of the, of the coordinate map. What should it be? The directional derivative, yep, at the point A. In the in the VJ direction, right? So let's make that a little less abstract. That means differentiate with respect to time the function with what a plus t VJ, and then you set t equals to zero at the end of that. That is just a careful way, as careful as we can today of saying you differentiate the jth component while fixing the rest of them. Like you let the, the, the variable of the input to f vary in the jth direction, but that's it. Yeah. What do you mean by letting t equals 0 at the end? What, what do you think of the limit? Or are we I'll, I'll give you an explicit example here in just a second. So I mean, you differentiate, first differentiate. Once the differentiation is done, you got some t's, presumably. And then you put t equal to 0. That's the directional derivative. You guys like this because it's a way of not actually calculating this limit of this difference quotient, right? Differentiation is more fun than calculating difference quotients for most of us. All right, now here's the theorem, which I won't prove today, but this is the connection, all right? If partial f, partial xj, um, mapping from, say, the domain of f um, to, where would that go? It goes to w, right? Um, is continuous for each j n. I don't know what that would mean, dvj, d of vj. I mean, vj is a basis vector. Isn't that like in like, calc 3, like, isn't that like basically x, y, z, Well, in calc 3, I gave the same definition, except that it's not an abstract basis. Here, it's, it's you know, um, x hat, y hat, z hat, or the, the unit vectors in the direction of x, y, or z. That's, if you look at what that says in terms of a formula, for example, um, well, let me not let me talk about that after class to you because it's we're gonna. Um, but th this is exactly the definition that I gave in Calc three for a partial derivative. If you if you just sort through it, the difference is is that v is an abstract basis now, so it's kind of okay. Anyway, here's the this is a big theorem. If the partial derivatives are all continuous, all right, then What you're asking is a good question, Jess. I'll, I will get back to that with you, OK? Um, then 
the differential, all right, at A of F. Um, acting on H, all right? Now, but I'm going to write H in terms of the basis. H is what? If I expand H in terms of the what basis? H is in the domain, so the V basis. So if H sub I, V sub I, I equals 1 to N, then this is just equal to um, a sum I equals 1 to N of H I D A F of V I. And here's, here's the, um, so the, the, the most technical thing in what I'm saying is that the differential exists. Because that's to assume that that Fréchet, diff that Fréchet quotient tends to zero, which is a statement about a multivariate limit. These are single variate things. There's no multivariate limit going on here. This is a directional derivative. So this, though, once you have existence, this formula is basically this is, by the way, partial f, um, partial xi at the point a. So in other words, if the partial derivatives all exist, and if they're continuous, I can build the differential from the partial derivatives. Now in future lectures, I'm going to make it much more explicit. We're going to work on concrete mappings from Rn to Rm. The course does not stay as abstract as I'm being right now, okay? So don't, don't despair if the, the matrixness of what we're doing right now is, is bothering you. So what I want to do, though, is I'm not going to prove. This, is, this takes me about a half hour to prove. It's technical. Um, I mean, by the way, if you drop the con assumption of continuity, you can have directional derivatives existing in all possible directions and not have differentiability in the Fréchet sense. Because of the quirks of the multivariate limit, you can have all the limits along lines going to something, but the, like the quadratic limits go to other things. That same problem we face for the Fréchet, for the Fréchet quotient, because it's, again, a multivariate limit. OK, that said, let's go back to the aha example. Right? So what's the standard basis there? We'll use, I'm going to use a notation, basically, let, just let me keep it short. It's basically E11, da 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 da, <laughs> ENN, right? So essentially, your, your coordinate map, phi beta, it's these guys, x, i, j. We'll use a double index because that's the natural thing to do. So i, j is playing the role that, that i played over here, for example. And so what would, what would be, let's actually calculate that partial derivative then, OK? And then we'll, I'll show you the t equals 0 thing explicitly. So partial f, partial x, i, j at the point A is supposedly what? By definition, ddt of what? What do we do? f of A plus t times eij. Right? So what is it? Square that. What happens when we square this? We get what we get. Let me just do it off on the side here. A plus T E I J times A plus. I'll write it out so we can see it. So what do you get? You get A squared, right? Plus, I'm going to factor the T out. T um, E I J A plus what? T A E I J. The order matters. These are matrix multiplications. They don't commute. Plus what? Plus t squared eij quantity squared. Differentiating. We do component-wise, which means that it's just the intuitive thing you'd expect. You can basically just differentiate the t's, and if things are constants, they ride along. So differentiating this is as simple as just what you'd expect. I mean, a squared differentiates to 0. It's got no t-dependence. This becomes what? eij. A plus A E I J 
and then plus 2t eij quantity squared. But since we're setting t equal to 0, it's gone. Right? So there you have it. That's the partial derivative of f with respect to the ijth coordinate. Now, let's use my purple theorem. I'm claiming that dA f of h is equal to a sum. In this case, it's going to be a sum over i and j of h i j partial f i j uh, partial f ah, stupid partial x i j of a right. That's what I'm claiming. Again, i is getting played by the role i j here. So that's the sum over i j of h h i j e i j a plus h i j a e i j. Sorry, my handwriting's getting kind of screwy down there. So sum, if I was shorter, oh well. So you can group things. We have h i j e i j parentheses times a plus I can pull the um, h i j is a constant, so I can pull it inside. I can factor the a out. What's the sum of h i j e j overall at i and j? It's just h, right? So that's h a plus a h. Ha ha! Right back where we started. But this time, you guys will like it more because we derived it using partial differentiation rather than looking at a difference of things and you know finding a linear piece. But this is a more direct way to calculate, obviously. But to do it, I assumed a pretty big technical thing here to avoid the limit. But once we do this, once we prove the purple theorem, then that will get us around the trouble of actually facing the Frechet quotient. We'll just go, OK, well, we got component functions. They're continuous. Good to go. We can go on our life calculus three style, basically, and differentiate until our heart's content. Um, well, because any matrix, right, we can write as, so for example, A, it's a sum over I and J of A, I, J, E, e I, J. Right, exactly. That, that's exactly the expansion of H in the standard basis, yeah. So what I'm going to do next time, you guys, is I'm going to prove a product rule of product rules. I will give you the proof of a product rule, which simultaneously shows you the differentiation properties of the dot product, the cross product, the matrix product, um, the product in an associative linear algebra, as well as the scalar multiple of a function times another vector valued function. We will do all of those product rules at once. And then I will stop being so abstract and I will talk to you about the standard matrix. And the, basically, the different, if we have V and W are Rn and Rm, then the differential is actually a linear transformation from Rn to Rm. And the standard matrix of that linear transformation is what we call the Jacobian matrix. And to get the Jacobian matrix, we just do ordinary calculus three style partial derivatives and that's you know what the primary focus of about the next 30 40 percent of the course is so but I, I think it's important to see some of these things at the level of norm linear spaces uh, because it helps you grow in terms of linear algebra and it's important to know that it's not so far out there it's actually just the same things as we're doing in RN to RM other instructors would probably argue you should just show you RM and RN and then if you're interested you could figure this out on your own but in all my teaching, I've never had a student come in and talk to me about figuring this out on their own, so I can only assume they're not doing it. <laughs> but I don't know. Teach his own. Am I out of time? Yeah. Oh, man. All right, I'll stop then. <laughs>